Welcome to our fifth episode of Commission the City Revival History course. This one's going to be a ton of fun. Most of you have probably never heard of the Ulster Revival. There's a crazy story in the middle of the revival that kind of personifies the whole thing of just people's hunger and unwillingness to leave their churches because of how hungry they were for Jesus. A young man named Jerry is asked to go five miles to speak at a church, walks there, gets there in normal service time, starts preaching, gives his best message. He wasn't a trained pastor. At the end of it, he tells everyone it's time to go, gives the benediction, no one will leave. Five times he preaches a message, gives the benediction, says it's time to go, and they just won't go. He's so tired, as you can imagine. He walks outside, he takes his shirt off, and he wrings it out, and literally sweat like water is pouring from his shirt. He puts it back on, goes back in the church, and another hour he preaches. Finally, he gives a last benediction, and now we're in the middle of the night, early in the morning even, and the people finally leave. But now he's got to walk home five miles. End of the service, walks five more miles home, finally gets home. Can imagine how tired he'd be. Goes in the door, probably ready for some sleep, only to hear a knock at the door. And there's a man standing there saying, can you please show me the way to salvation? These are the kinds of stories that marked the Ulster Revival. All right, before I jump into the story, let me give you three main points to look out for in the story. These are also going to be our application points. Number one is the importance of understanding the divinity and the humanity of Christ, a strong foundation. Number two, we're going to talk about the power of your testimony. Don't need to be a famous preacher. You have a story. And number three, we're going to talk about the power of repentance and the conviction of sin in birthing and sustaining a move of God. All right, here we go into the story. Now, the Ulster Revival takes place in 1859, but I'm going to real quick rewind 30 years into the beginnings of this, a really important moment that set Ulster up for the move of God. At this time, two particular heresies have come into the church, threatening their understanding of Jesus. The main heresy was trying to write Jesus out of the Trinity by saying that he was not actually divinity. He wasn't God. He was created by God, but he was lesser than God. Now, there were leaders all across the church that rose up and said, this is not right. This is not our creeds. This is not the historic faith. But these ideas were seeping into lots of churches and denominations. So it was creating a major tension and kind of a collision course. Now, there's this hero. I think he's a hero. This Dr. Cook, who says enough is enough, and he calls a public debate with the guys who are carrying this heresy and kind of, you know, letting it seep into the church. And he says, I know the word and I know the truth. And he calls him to a public debate. And you got to, you read the story. It's so moving because this guy, Dr. Cook, obliterates these guys who are pushing the heresy. So much so that it says at the end of his final speech, people took their shoes off and they were clapping them together loudly celebrating because he just decimated their arguments. I, I get chills thinking about this moment where a man took a stand on truth because of his love for Jesus and said, I will not allow this in the church. Now, what's incredible is that after that public argument, the pastors of the churches went, oh my gosh, this is right and this is true. And they closed the door to the heresy and the churches by and large said, no way, Jesus is fully God and Jesus is fully man. Now, this paved the way for what God was about to do without an understanding of the divinity and the humanity of Christ. There is no revival. So 30 years later, fast forward to the Ulster revival. Now they've they've laid their foundation stones correctly now. But honestly, in the accounts of that time, there's no fire in the church. They're on theological footing, but they have no young people. That literally says that they're not only lethargic in prayer, they were like opposed to prayer meetings. They didn't want to pray. There was this antagonism towards prayer. So we're not in a revival culture. We might have solid theological foundation, but it needs the fire of God. Now it comes from an unlikely source, like so many stories. And I hope that every time you hear that, you feel empowered because like it or not, you and I are unlikely sources. We feel like unlikely sources, but God always uses unlikely sources sources to bring about his will. A young lady or a middle-aged lady named Mrs. Colville. 
in England. She has an encounter with God that is so remarkable that she goes into like a zone of passion and zeal that her family had never seen before. And because of it, they ostracize her and they essentially kick her out of the family. They think she's kind of lost her mind, but she is just undone with zeal for God. A missions organization picks her up and says, hey, we have need of you. And they send her to Ulster, which is a northern province in Ireland, to be a missionary. She starts going door to door, knocking on doors and praying for people, real simple. Just sharing the gospel. I mean, nothing glamorous, nothing flashy. She just has a passion and a love for Jesus. One day she's in a home, a woman's pouring out her heart and Mrs. Colville just begins to pour out her heart about her love for Jesus and Jesus' ability to wash us clean and to save us. And standing in the distance is a man named James McQuilkin who would become a catalyst to this move of God. And you gotta love this. I'm gonna read you this quote because I think it's so powerful. It says, uh, as, as uh, he was listening, that he questioned in his mind whether she was uh, truly a Calvinist. That was his issue. So he says, he asked her, are you a Calvinist or not? And she goes, well, I would wish uh, not to be more or less a Calvinist than Jesus or his apostles. But she continued, I do not care to talk mere points of doctrine. I would rather speak of the experience of salvation in the soul. If one were to tell me what he knows of the state of his heart towards God, I think I could tell him whether he knows the Lord Jesus savingly. Now that might sound contradictory to what I just shared about Dr. Cook paving the foundation on the divinity and humanity of Christ, but this is both and. This is a strong foundation, but understanding that Christianity is about a relationship. It is about um, intimacy with Jesus. It is about communion with him and the forgiveness of our sins. And though this man, James McQuilkin, may have had a good foundation, he had no relationship with Jesus. And as she shares, he is convicted that he has an academic understanding with no heart revelation, no relationship. He goes home and he is tormented. And he, like many others we read about in history, finally prevails in his torment and he has an encounter with the love of God. It would go on to change his life. Long story short, three of his friends would hear the testimony of his changed life and they would get radically saved and encounter the love of God because of it. And that winter, December of 1859, these four men would grab a whole pile of what they called peat, which they would burn to keep themselves warm. And every Friday night, they would go to an empty schoolhouse they would put the peat on the hearth and turn, light it on fire and it would warm the room and they would pray till two or three in the morning, reading the scriptures and praying, God, move in Ulster, fill the churches, release the conviction of sin and the revelation of the Messiah. Now that prayer meeting just went on faithfully every Friday night all the way through the winter until they saw the first salvation in the community. And a few months later, there were 16 prayer meetings a night in that city, a hundred a week in one little town because God gripped the town with the revelation of the conviction of sin and the power of his love. You see this again and again in moves of God throughout history is that it truly rides on an authentic conviction of both the love of God and the conviction of sin, the darkness of compromise. And the solution to the darkness of compromise and the conviction of sin is the love of Jesus. And it's the love of Jesus that convicts us of compromise and sin. We will never have a move of God if we are embracing compromise. We will never see God move in our families, our lives, or our cities if we are allowing lukewarm Christianity, compromise, areas of sin in the corners of our life, we'll never see a move of God. And that was what gripped Ulster. The conviction of sin began to spread all across the nation. And as it did, people poured into the prayer meetings. And there's amazing quotes by pastors saying, for years we tried to get people in the church, now saying, but now we can't get them out of the church. Regularly, prayer meetings were going till two or three in the morning with multiple messages and worship and conviction of sin. Something happened in these moves of God that caused a little bit of controversy, and you'll find that in every move of God, there's always controversy. When people were undone by the weight of their sin, they often would fall to the ground, and sometimes they'd be there for two or three hours. All the testimony showed that when they would finally get up off the ground, they were transformed. And when you would interview them as to what happened, usually it was the combination of the conviction of sin and the overwhelming love of God. They didn't have a word for it, so they just said they were stricken down. And they'd say things like, hey, did you hear that Sally was stricken down yesterday? They would see, uh, you know, in a part of a room, a bunch of people.
people and they've gotten struck down by the power of God. That was the phrase they used to describe those who were so overwhelmed by God's presence, so undone by their compromise and their sin that they fell to their feet, repenting, experiencing God, and they got up transformed. This happened again and again. Now, these prayer meetings spread all across Ulster, and really the revival was absolutely not only catalyzed, but sustained in this type of prevailing prayer. It pinnacled with some cities gathering 30 to 40,000 people in the empty streets of their cities, all wanting to simply hear the testimonies of those who had experienced the move of God. They wanted to hear the preaching of the simple gospel, and they wanted to worship. Just take a moment here to say that your testimony is more powerful than you realize. We feel like if we're not a great preacher or don't have like really great sermon notes or we don't know the Greek or the Hebrew that maybe we can't be used in that way. But the Ulster Revival shows that it's the testimony of someone who's encountered raw God that people are actually hungry for. And that testimony actually spreads the encounter and more people encounter raw God. They saw this again and again. In these, uh, out, these massive gatherings of 30 to 40,000, there was no way they could all hear one speaker so they have multiple speakers in different areas of the crowd all sharing their testimonies all preaching the simple gospel and again this spread across the nation and the region and they say a hundred thousand people were saved because of the Ulster revival now guys time out sometimes we think that revival is a fairy tale Sometimes we get in our minds like, I don't know how it could ever happen. Sometimes we think it's just going to mean our churches somehow maybe just get a little bigger, a little bigger, and evil gets maybe a little less, a little less. We need to increase our faith and our expectation. If God could do it in Ulster, He can do it in America. If He could do it in Ulster in 1859, He can do it in any nation today in 2020. God wants to give us faith and expectation that revival is real, His power is real, and everything changes when His Spirit is poured out. Now we're going to talk in our next episode about how this fire that started in the layman's prayer revival spreads across the ocean to the Ulster revival also spread it all the way to South Africa through a man named Andrew Murray and an amazing move of God that occurred there. Forgot one thing really important to this whole series is that when these four men began to pray in that winter of 1859 and uh, they were freshly converted to Jesus really wholeheartedly. They heard the story and the testimony, the layman's prayer revival in New York City and now across America. And when that seed of faith landed in Ulster among these four, it was the faith they needed to go, oh my gosh, this is bigger than we realize. And if he did it in America, he can do it in Ireland. All right, we're gonna talk about three application points uh, so that we walk away with, this, with real activation in our lives and with real revelation. The first thing we're gonna talk about is the importance of being able to answer the question, who is Jesus? The world around us would do anything to get us to compromise on that belief system. Because if he really is God, that means everything he said and everything he did is absolutely true. And it means that there really is only one way to eternal life. So there's this constant pressure to water down Jesus. He's a good preacher, a prophet. He, he was a great teacher, but he wasn't just that. He was the son of God, fully God and fully man. Had the Ulster, uh, the region of Ulster not cemented that in their foundation, they never could have experienced the outpouring because they couldn't have believed that Jesus actually was the Messiah that he said that he was and that he still is today. Number two, we're talking about the power of testimony. As we saw in the Ulster Revival, these four men who really were catalytic in it, they weren't trained preachers, they weren't great pastors, they just had a testimony. They had a story that God had broken, forgiven them of their sins, freed them from their compromise, washed them white as snow, and that they had encountered His real and tangible presence. That story catalyzed the Ulster Revival. You have a testimony. You have a story. You may not feel like a preacher. You may not feel like you've got the greatest message message or that you even like speaking to people, but you've got to know your testimony is powerful and Jesus will use your simple story of how he's moved in your life to rock people's lives, to shake them out of their own lies, their own compromise, and to bring the revelation of Jesus into their lives as well. Number three, we're going to talk about the power briefly of repentance. We see in the Ulster Revival and really every move of God in history was marked by repentance. We cannot believe today that we're actually going to experience the fullness of God's promises or His prophecies or His outpouring in our lives or our cities without believing that it's going to be accompanied with real repentance. The fear of the Lord 
the ridding of compromise in our lives, uh, forgiveness, dealing with offense, dealing with bitterness. All of these things are critical to preparing the heart for a move of God. I just want to say to you on a very personal level right now, this is a time to get right with God. If you are holding on to compromise, you are simply holding back the Spirit of God from moving in your life. Repentance is a gift that He's given us that forgives us of our sins and breaks the power of sin in our lives, allowing us to run from compromise and run towards Jesus. Again, society would want to water down repentance. The scriptures would say very differently. Repentance is a gift and it leads to your freedom. So I encourage you today, these points, allow them to become real in your life. God wants to fill us with faith today that what he did in Ulster, he can do it again today.